welcome to Creating a Family, talk about adoption and infertility. Today's show will be on using an adoption consultant, an adoption facilitator, or an adoption attorney. There's a great deal of confusion that exists out there on the differences and, and the benefits or the, uh, of these type of uh, options. Here's a sample of what we're going to hear today. When a, a lawyer is an adoption lawyer, they are, an ad, they are a lawyer first, and then they're an adoption lawyer. By that I mean there are canons of professional conduct. There are duties that are required by law that a lawyer has and must give to um, that client. And by so doing, when a lawyer is working with um, an expectant, he has to be clear whether he's representing that parent or representing the adoptive parent, um, whether or not um, it's very important for any person who might be unrepresented to make sure that they have access to um, appropriate counsel throughout the the process so that the lines of representation don't get blurred. Um, That's a key component of any duty of professional conduct or fiduciary duty that a lawyer has is to make sure that all the parties are represented and are empowered and affirmed, especially expectant mothers who might be going through this ever so important decision to be empowered and affirmed to make the best decision for themselves and and for that child. I'm Dawn Davenport, the Director of Creating a Family. We are the National Adoption and Infertility Education and Support Organization. You can find us online at creatingafamily.org. And I am particularly excited on today's show to tell you that we have launched our brand new website. You know, if you listen carefully, you're going to hear champagne pop, champagne corks popping in the background around here. We launched yesterday. It is. Uh, we are just so excited about the new site. We're also excited to have it launched and off of our to-do list. But even more so, uh, we uh, it, we spent a really long time uh, with our developers coming up with what we think is really the absolute best navigational system um, that exists. We have so many resources on adoption and infertility uh, that it's a it's a, a good problem to have. But it's still an issue of how you can make that that many resources um, easily to navigate. And we really think we've done that. So please check out the new website at creatingafamily.org and uh, and then uh, post about it on your social networks and tell people what you think, especially if you like it. And if you don't, you can say that, but, but for the most part, we hope you like it. Uh, we are a weekly radio show podcast, or this is, the Creating a Family Talk About Adoption and Infertility is a weekly radio show, and we utilize the podcast model. Um, we do that so that we can uh, archive all the shows and then have a vast library from 2007 of topics for you to, to search through. That's one reason we use the podcast model, and the other one is podcasting allows you to subscribe to the episodes so you can listen to them whenever and wherever you are or want to. You can download it to your phone, to your tablet, to your computer, or whatever. You can subscribe at our website, creatingafamily.org slash radio show, or you can uh, subscribe on iTunes or, quite frankly, whatever device you are listening to this show right now from, you can subscribe to the Creating a Family uh, show from there. The Creating a Family radio show is underwritten by our corporate sponsor, Faring Pharmaceutical. Faring is pleased to offer the IVF Greenlight program, providing discounts of up to 50% on select IVF products. All cash-paying patients are eligible, and unlike other programs, there are no financial requirements. This show, as well as all the resources provided by Creating a Family, could not and would not happen without the generous support support from our gold sponsors, who believe in our mission of providing unbiased education and support to pre- and post-adoptive families and to the patient community. Some of our wonderful gold sponsors include the law offices of James Fletcher Thompson. They are a South Carolina firm committed to adoption and assisted reproductive law. We also have Bethany Christian Services. They are a global nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering children and families. They are committed to quality social services along the child welfare continuum, services ranging from pregnancy counseling and family preservation to foster care and adoption. We also have Children's Connections. They are an adoption agency with offices throughout Texas, providing domestic infant adoption, embryo donation adoption, home studies, and post-adoption support to families really throughout the United States. 
Those were our gold sponsors, but we also have other great sponsors whose generosity allows us to bring you this show. We ask that when choosing an adoption or infertility service provider, <clears throat> please consider choosing one from the Creating a Family directories, which you can find on the service provider page of our site. You can search by location, services provided, just a whole host of factors that we think are important when choosing. And by using these directories, you support those who support us, and we thank you. Today we're going to be talking about using an adoption consultant, an adoption facilitator, or an adoption attorney. Our guests are Jim Thompson. He is an adoption and reproductive law attorney in South Carolina and a fellow of the American Academy of Adoption Attorneys. We also have Nicole Witt. She is with the Adoption Consultancy. And Lisa Sweet. She is a licensed California facilitator with Sweet Beginnings Adoption. Welcome, Jim Thompson, Lisa Sweet, and Nicole Witt to Creating a Family. Thanks Thank for you. having me, Don. Well, I think, as always, it's always best to begin with the basics. Uh, and I think, given the, uh, I think as I'm, uh, as I mentioned at the at the beginning of the show, there is a great deal of confusion out there on what. There's a difference between a consultant, a facilitator, an attorney. Uh, why would one want to use it? Uh, there's just a lot of confusion. We actually, this was uh, one of the top, uh, every November we go out, uh, do a survey of our audience, seeing what topics uh, they are interested in having shows uh, on the next year. And we got two people requesting, not exactly the same thing, but but in this general, uh, each of them wanting confusion, expressing confusion about this area. So what I want to do is start and ask each of you just a basic definition of what it is that 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 you do. So let me start with you, Nicole. Nicole Whip. Um, I you're an ad- adoption consultant with the Adoption Consultancy. What is an adoption consultant? I tell people sort of a a quick and simple way to get it is that we're sort of like a wedding planner for adoption. So we guide people step-by-step through the process, but we work exclusively with and for the pre-adoptive parents. So I'm so glad you're doing this show because I think there is so much confusion on this topic, and I don't think it's necessarily an either-or um, situation, you, you know, there, there's. I, I would certainly always have somebody have an attorney involved with an adoption, but our role is just to provide them resources and support, and and to kind of hold their hands step by step through the whole adoption process. Okay, so that's an adoption consultant, Lisa. Lisa Sweet with Sweet Beginnings. You are a facilitator. What is a, a basic definition? What is a facilitator? An adoption facilitator. Well, a facilitator does a lot of what a consultant does. We do all those things that Nicole just mentioned. In addition, we also provide case management during um, an adoption plan. So a lot of times, um, and, and I should say that every facilitator in California does offers a little bit of a different service, so it's always important to ask when you're reaching out to a facilitator in California what they provide. Um, Because in California, anybody who provides any adoption-related services and charges a fee for that has to register as a facilitator. So some facilitators could just be offering um, pre- and post-adoption education and support, while others um, offer matching services and others also work with women who come to us um, pregnant and are interested in doing adoption plans. But we always have an agency or an attorney involved to do the legal process, um, the, the placement services, and we also work with consultants from other areas of the country who are working with families who um, need a little extra assistance in completing their adoption plans. Okay, Jim uh, Jim Thompson with the law offices of Jim Thompson. Um, what Give us a basic definition of what an adoption attorney is and does. Sure, Dawn. Um, I think it's important to recognize that adoption is a hybrid of both law and social work. Um, Neither a a lawyer can't complete an adoption without um, the important components of the the social work side of of adoption. Um, For instance, the the home study, the pre-placement home investigation, the post-placement home investigation, the medical and social histories, that are done on the birth parent. Um, The attorney um, may be involved 
on the on uh, on a, a variety of of aspects of the adoption, he or she may be involved with the matching. Um, in certain states, lawyers may participate in matching a prospective adoptive parent with a with a, a birth mother. Um, in other states, um, it's primarily agencies that do that, and then the attorney would be involved only on finalizing the adoption, going to court and having the adoptive parents declare the the, uh, the legal parents of the child. Um, so it it really depends on the model, and it depends on the state. Okay, and we'll come back. And then when you and I, and uh, the way we're going to organize the, re- the next part of the show is we're going to focus on uh, I'm going to be talking with Nicole about what consultancy is, and I'm going to talk with Lisa about what facilitators do. And then I'm going to come back to talking with Jim about attorneys. So let me now turn to Nicole. Let me talk to you about how do consultants, you said that you work uh, exclusively for the adoptive families. Um, how do you help the families? How, and, and also, it's not just, I, it, and when possible, if you could expand, not just talking about your consultancy service, but also mm-hmm. what consultants kind of generally do. Um, and, and if it differs, then uh, let us know about that. So how do consultants help mm-hmm. adoptive families? Yeah, and I, I think um, to clarify the difference or to expand on what Lisa was saying, just uh, to try to eliminate any confusion, um, there is definitely overlap between what consultants and facilitators do. The big difference is that uh, consultants never work with birth parents. We don't do matching. We don't do anything like that. We we connect our families with agencies and attorneys and, in some cases, facilitators who can do that matching. Okay, so that's, that's one of the big differences. And um, from my perspective, I, I feel that that allows us to be just fully objective with our adoptive parents because it doesn't, we don't really, it, it doesn't matter to us if, if they match through one particular agency or one particular attorney, you know, we can kind of give them a fully objective opinion on the situation. Um, so what we do is that we provide, and, and what most consultants do, is pro- provide a lot of education up front in terms of, you know, here's what to expect from adoption as a whole. You know, here here's how it works. Here are some of the things that you need to think about when it comes to birth parents and interacting with birth parents and, and how to work very effectively with agencies and attorneys and um, doing risk assessment on opportunities that come up and that sort of thing. Uh, another important perspective or another uh, important portion of it is helping families create their profile. So that's kind of like the scrapbook that the birth moms use to select the adoptive parents. So it's really critical in getting selected. Different consultants are going to have different levels of involvement uh, in terms of helping the family create the profile. Um, Some provide guidance and have the family create it themselves. That's what we do. Others uh, kind of outsource that to people who just do profiles, and others will actually create it for the family. And then probably the the third big component of what we do is that we create a customized plan with several agencies and attorneys, um, and again, in some cases, facilitators, um, who we think can best help those families, you know, based on their budget and their timeline and their state laws and their personalities and so on. Um, And then we get our clients out there with multiple different places so that they have as many opportunities as possible, you know, as compared to somebody who might just sign up with, say, one local agency. Do all adoption agencies or attorneys or facilitators allow their families to also work with consultants or to allow their families to work with multiple agencies? Maybe that's two different questions. Let me stop. Let me ask. Let me break yeah. that into two. First, let's talk about whether they allow their families to work with consultants. And the second question is, do they allow them to work with multiple agencies? Right. Well, you know, I, I've never come across a uh, an agency or attorney that wouldn't allow their family to work with a consultant, but I guess that's a little bit more dependent on your second question there, because if they don't want their families working with another agency besides them, it really wouldn't make sense for their families to work with a consultant. So those might be the instances in which they would discourage it. 
Um, so, so to answer that second question, no, not all agencies allow their families to be signed up with anybody else if they're signed up with them. And, and some other agencies in theory say, well, that's fine, but they charge so much money in terms of an application fee, you know, maybe $10,000 plus, that it's really financially unrealistic for anybody to sign up with anybody else, you know, once they're signed up with them. Um, so, so not all, all agencies um, do support that, but many fantastic agencies do, um, and, and there are many of them out there that have low enough application fees, you know, sometimes nothing, sometimes $100 or a few hundred dollars, so that it's financially realistic for families to get out there with several different places. Do you uh, and do other consultants work with the same group of agencies, or can you work with any uh, agency uh, that doesn't have, as you point out, either a prohibition on signing up for multiple ones, uh, multiple agencies, or a fee structure so that it's just unreasonable to, um, to, to right, sign up? Right, right. In, in theory, you know, we, we can work with any. Um, my approach, and I expect it's the same approach with most, if not all, consultants, is that, you know, of, of course, we work with people who we have vetted, um, who we've, we have a good relationship with. You know, we can confidently recommend them to our clients. We know that they're ethical and reputable and, um, you know, that, that their policies are, are favorable, et cetera. And also, um, I, I do, and again, I expect that most, if not all other consultants do, we tend to focus in the states where the laws are most protective of the adoptive parents. You know, most adoptive parents want to avoid the states where maybe there's a lengthy revocation period, for instance, where the birth parents can change their mind. Um, so we tend to focus more in the states where there's no revocation period. But that's going to be driven to an extent of what our families are looking for. If they say that doesn't matter to me, I just don't want to travel very far, it, well then, you know, we'll, we'll recommend places closer in their area. Can you work with families in all states? Um, we can work with families in all states because, we, again, we're not working with birth mothers and we're not matching, um, and, and that's kind of what the laws, you know, talk about and are concerned about. Um, but since we're not doing that, since we're pro providing basically an educational resource, uh, we are able to. Okay. And if you aren't already working with an attorney or an agency, do you need to be in order to adopt? Well, we, we'd certainly recommend that in, at, at some point in the adoption that you have either an agency or an attorney involved. With, with our approach to it, we usually it's the agency or attorney who's actually doing the matching and, and taking those adoptive parents through that whole process. But certainly there are situations where the adoptive parents might find a birth mom on their own. They might have been working with somebody else prior, and a match comes through that, through personal networking, et cetera. Um, but we certainly encourage our clients to get, you know, a licensed entity involved as, as early as possible in the process. Okay, and, and bottom line, why hire a consultant if you're already working with an attorney or an adoption agency? Um, for several reasons. One is that it can get you a lot more exposure and a lot more opportunities. You know, again, if you're out there with, say, five different agencies, you know, just mathematically, you're going to have a lot more opportunities than if you're signed up with one. So we get a lot of people, for instance, who've been with one agency, they've been waiting a very long time, and they're frustrated, and they want to do something more proactive, and they want to get more exposure. Um, so, so that's part of it. Um, also, a lot of people, even if they are already signed up with somebody, um, they might not feel like they are quite, you know, and, and certainly this isn't true of, of all places, but sometimes they feel like they're not getting as much one-on-one um, -on -one attention or education, or they still feel a little bit unsure about how does the process work, and they really want to have somebody who, know, who they know is just purely an unbiased advocate for them. Um, sometimes there are people who feel like, you know what, my profile hasn't really been cutting it, and, and I really need some help. I need somebody experienced to help me, um, you know, bump up this profile and have it do a better job. Or, you know, I just want that person that I can call and talk to um, about what the birth mom said to me yesterday, um, you know, and get their opinion on it without feeling like I'm, I'm bothering my agency or needing to pay an, an hourly rate or, you know, something like that. So there are lots of different reasons why somebody might come to an, a consultant even after they've started the process on their own. Okay. 
And before we move to uh, talking about facilitators, let me remind you that you are listening to Creating a Family, and today we're talking about using an adoption consultant, an adoption attorney, or an adoption facilitator. Creating a Family has the largest adoption in infertility communities on the social networks, and we would love to have you join us. There are three ways to connect with us on Facebook. Uh, you could connect with me personally, dawn.davenport1. You can, of course, uh, like our Creating a Family Facebook page, which is Creating a Family, um, or you can join our large, active, and really supportive support group, uh, which you can find by the easiest. It's called Creating a Family. The easiest way to find that on uh, Facebook is to type in the words Creating a Family in the Facebook search box. The page and the group will pop up. You can like the page and join the group. Um, we are also active on a lot of the other social networks. Pinterest is a particular favorite around here. We have over, or I think close to, right at 30 boards um, covering just all sorts of visual ideas that have to do with adoption, education-oriented, but also just fun, inspirational, whatever. Uh, we, you can, can, we're, we are creating a family over on Pinterest. Uh, we also are active, very active on Twitter, and you can find us at Creating a Family on Twitter. We are on Google Plus as well, so you know, join us over there. Again, Creating a Family over there. All right, now moving to talk about adoption facilitators. Uh, Lisa, you are an adoption facilitator. How do facilitators differ from an adoption agency? Oh, a lot. Um First of all, facilitators don't do placement, and I think that's that's one of the major differences in in the work that what we do. What do you mean by What do you mean by don't do placement? Well, we we work with birth moms, but we don't do the actual legal placement of the child, the baby. That's um, in the work that we do. If we're working with a birth mom or an attorney, it's usually an independent private adoption, and the the mother herself is doing the placement. So with an agency adoption, the agency actually takes um, legal custody and they do the placement themselves. So that's a that's a legal piece that we're not a, we're not um, legally allowed to do. Um, we also are not required to be um, licensed, although we are required to be registered. So we don't facilitators don't have a board of directors. We don't have um, a social worker on staff. Um, and other um, entities like that on staff. And I think that's one of the uh, major differences between agencies and facilitators, although facilitators will offer a lot of the services that agencies do, but we just we hire in the professionals to do that. Let me stop here and, and, and because I'm, I have been confused on this. Jim, um, as an attorney, let me ask you this question because I know you uh, know the laws throughout well, not all the laws throughout the United States, but you are up on the adoption laws. Um, the uh, is it always the case that with an adoption agency in a infant domestic infant adoption that the adoption agency actually takes custody, uh, uh, legal custody of the child, and then uh, turns over that legal custody for the adoptive parents? Is that is that across the board in the United States how it's done? No, there can be a variety of of circumstances depending on state law and these are important but very nuanced distinctions it also comes down to between the difference between a relinquishment and a consent under some state law meaning under some states the birth parent may be choosing a prospective adoptive family and then placing that child directly with that family or they may be relinquishing the child to a licensed child placing agency and then that agency making placement with the family. Um, okay. so those are fairly subtle distinctions, but in terms of who has custody at any given time, it could be important. Um, but I think the important point here that I think I was hearing Lisa make that is that the facilitator under any of those circumstances would not be accepting the consent or the relinquishment would not be okay. taking custody of the child and, and placing the child. Correct. Okay. There always has to be um, an attorney, an adoption service provider, or um, or the agency taking consent. Okay. So, Lisa, how can facilitators, uh, Why? How do, how do facilitators help adoptive families? Um, 
I, when Nicole was talking, I kept wanting to say, yeah, yeah, yes, that's what we do. Um, so <laughs> Nicole provided a really great explanation. Um, we do we do all of those things that consultants do, um, and families come to us at all different stages. It's it's an interesting thing that that is probably a big difference between consultants and facilitators too. Is that families come to us? Um, it seems after they've been waiting a year or two for placement, and then and and they want to make their um, broaden their options. They want to have um, even families who have made that major commitment financially to agencies um, and thought that that's where they were going to stay, end up coming to us. And we actually have agencies now, a couple of national agencies, that are referring their families to us after a year or two of waiting because we we tend to, although we're very small, um, and most facilitators are, although there's some larger facilitators out here in California, most of us work with just a, a handful or two of families at a time, and we've made some really great connections in in our profession. Like Nicole was um, saying, we've we've vetted uh, the professionals we work with. Uh, we work with people who we trust, who have good moral ethics, who share the same um, vision that we have in adoption, and so we are able to. Um, Find adoption planning. Find expectant moms that we can that want to find a family a little quicker than waiting on a national level. Um, well, that's a, let me ask you a question about that. How do you find expectant uh, moms who are considering adoption, or do you, as um, uh, as Nicole uh, described it with consultancies, do you work through agencies and attorneys that have already found the expectant moms? We do both. Probably about a third of the of the uh, adoption plans that we work with during the year are women that come to us directly, and their um, it, our um, service um, exclusively. Probably, I'm not speaking for other facilitators. I know other facilitators will do national advertising, um, but most of the women that we work with directly have come to us through our community. They've come to us. Um, my background has been doing social work and, and nursing in my community forever, and so people know what we do. And so, if they're working with somebody who's interested in talking about adoption, they'll have them call us. Um, other moms who have worked with us will refer other moms in their area to us. I mean, we even have moms who have worked with us continue to work with us and mentor other moms. So. Okay. It's we tend to stay within our community, and then we have about three or four um, adoption exclusive attorneys that uh, work in the same way that we provide a service, which is direct case management, and um, we will work with them as well. Do I mean all adoptions are required to have all adoptive families are required to have a home study prior to adoption? I think that's the case in all states uh, in the U.S. Do you? Uh, uh, do you provide the home study uh, and the actual report as well as the process, or is that something that uh, uh, um, families have to hire out and, and go to a separate entity, a separate agency that will be doing the home study? They have to go out to a separate um, home study agency, and we have a couple that we refer to. Um, because we are not licensed social workers, we can't provide those home studies, and we don't have a licensed social worker on staff. Um, but we we do have a couple of uh, really great agencies that we use here in California. And if we work with families from other areas of the United States, um, we don't match anybody until we have a completed home study because I need to know that that family is able to pass one. Okay, so home studies is is something that in addition is, is outside of the scope of what uh, facilitators in general do. Um, Correct. All right. And can facilitators work with families in all states? I, I, you have mentioned a number of times that, you, that you're in California and that you talked about California facilitators. California, there are other states, I am sure, but California is one of the states that does allow facilitators. Um, can you work with families in all states or other no. facilitators? No, no. And, and, and there's really just, um, unfortunately, a handful of families that, of states that we can work with, and we're really careful about when um, people call and are, and are requesting services from us, that that's the one thing that we check first is, you know, where do you live and will your state allow you to use it? Because 
you know, you never want to put somebody's adoption plan in jeopardy because their state statutes don't allow the use of a facilitator. The, um, and I say California because that's where facilitators are. Um, I know in Florida they call, um, will sometimes interchange the word with adoption attorneys are considered facilitators. But in California, facilitators are, you know, a, a non-attorney, non-agency entity who are providing adoption services. Okay. Now let me turn to before, but actually before I turn to that, let me let me tell you about a few more of our gold sponsors, and then we're going to come back and talk to uh, Jim about uh, Jim Thompson about attorneys. Um, I want to remind you that uh, it is through our gold sponsors and their generous support and their belief in our mission that we can bring you this show as well as all the resources that creating a family. We have Nightlight Christian Adopt Nightlight Christian Adoptions with offices in California, Colorado, and South Carolina and adoption programs throughout the world as well as a domestic infant program and their Snowflakes Embryo Donation Embryo Adoption Program. We also have Spence Chapin. They are a full-service adoption agency bringing over 100 years of experience to a new direction. They are creating permanent loving families for children most in need, which includes older kids, siblings, and children with special needs. They have eliminated the financial barrier by providing no-fee adoption services for families who are able to open up their hearts and their homes to this special population of kiddos. All right, Jim, let's now talk about adoption attorneys. One of the things that uh, I think a lot of people don't realize is there's a great deal. Well, first of all, anybody who listens to creating, creating a family knows, and I, but I'm going to go ahead and give my spiel because I give it all the time. And adopt, uh, when you are considering uh, an adoption attorney, it is important that you select someone who specializes in adoption, and that is not necessarily the same as family law, nor is it your brother-in-law. Uh, who works uh, for a local corporation. Um, it truly is a specialty within law, and uh, and so it's it's not the same. You do need someone who, who does specialize. And Creating a Family has extensive resources uh, on our website on how to find uh, an attorney. Uh, and to find that, you would, uh, an attorney that specializes in adoption law, to do that, you would go to creatingafamily.org. Uh, and on the horizontal menu across the top, click on Adoption. Uh, click on A to Z resources, and then there's one on, repro- um, I mean, not reproductive law. We do have reproductive law and the infertility resources. Uh, find a, We have uh, independent adoption or adoption attorney. If you click on that page, you will be taken to a, a lot of resources to help you find someone. All right, now, Jim, there is uh, a lot of diversity uh, in the different approaches that attorneys, uh, that people might find in the services offered by adoption attorneys. Um, can you... Can you talk just a little about some of what people might expect or, or might see, some differences they might see, um, and what services are offered by people who do specialize in adoption, attorneys who do specialize in adoption? I'd be glad to, Dawn, and and thank you for making that point that, um, you know, all attorneys um, um, are not uh, similarly situated to handle an adoption or, for that matter, an assisted reproduction kind of case. Um, Mm -hmm. I didn't uh, handle my own loan closing for my house. (laughs) I didn't write my own will. Um, And um, those things just have become a little bit more um, um, specialized over the course of, um, you know, even my law practice over 25 years. I've seen a a subtle focus that that attorneys have. Um, And so... um, Jim, what I tell tell people is that I'm an attorney, and I did not handle, I did not specialize in adoption, and uh, I did not handle my own adoptions. I hired an adoption attorney to handle my adoptions because I knew what I didn't know, and I didn't want to screw it up. So uh, that's what well, I tell people. That, that's just kind of funny, Dawn, because um, I actually uh, was an adoption attorney when I adopted, and I still didn't do my own adoption. So um, <laughs> in, in, in any event... Um, you know, I think going to the, we often call it the Quad A, but the American Academy of Adoption Attorneys, just to Google that, and you can you can find an attorney by state and really mm-hmm. from your hometown. And and to be a member of the American Academy, you have to have done a significant number of adoptions, but also to have none of those um, ethical issues that uh, that any prospective adopting family would be uh, would be concerned about. Um, 
you we, also we have to take continuing our, ed courses in adoption. It's not something that you can just say, I specialize in. You have to continue to be educated in it if you're going to be a, a member right. of the American Academy of Adoption Attorneys. You are so right. Yep. All right. Yes. All right. So now, uh, but not all, but, but even within Quad A, the American Academy of Adoption Attorneys, or, uh, or whatever, even an attorney that specializes in adoption, there are still differences in how they and what services they offer. Absolutely, that's right. Um, there are um, adoption attorneys that may have a special um, uh, focus on social services adoptions or helping uh, the subsidies for special needs children or, um, you know, working solely with other adoption agencies and do not make adoptive placements themselves. Some adoptive parents, um, some adoption attorneys like myself actually may may do a variety of those things, including having um, expectant parents come to our office and work with our office or the social workers on our staff towards an adoption plan and, and to do those placements. And, and frankly, different states are set up differently. Some have a, a very strong adoption agency model, whereas in South Carolina, where I work, the... Uh, the infant adoptions to, um, in South Carolina are evenly divided between lawyer-based um, placements and agency-based place, uh, placements. So it really can depend on um, on, on where that is. And, and the consultants that we we talked about, um, Nicole, um, I think it's good to be able to say, okay, um, you're from, let's say, the, you know, State A. And that's sort of the focus of State A, but State B may also allow out-of-state um, families to adopt within their borders, because as you as you can guess, some states do not require that. So um, I think a consultant might be able to give that general overview of adoption resources. Can all attorneys match, all adoption attorneys no. match expectant moms with adopted parents? For sure not. Um, different states um, allow that. Some states do not. Some allow it, but uh, so long as there's no charge for it, it's uh, completely state-specific. So how does adopting through an adoption attorney differ from adopting through an adoption agency? I think the real issue about a, a lawyer, an attorney handling something, are the issues of representation and the duties of loyalty. Um, the fiduciary responsibility of a lawyer. Um, when a, a lawyer is an adoption lawyer, they are, an ad, they are a lawyer first, and then they're an adoption lawyer. By that I mean there are canons of professional conduct. There are duties that are required by law that a lawyer has and must give to um, that client. And by so doing, when a lawyer is working with um, an expectant, he has to be clear whether he's representing that parent or representing the adoptive parent, um, whether or not um, it's very important for any person who might be unrepresented to make sure that they have access to um, appropriate counsel throughout the, the process so that the lines of representation don't get blurred. Um, that's a key component of any duty of professional conduct or fiduciary duty that a lawyer has is to make sure that all the parties are represented and are empowered and affirmed, especially expectant mothers who might be going through this ever so important decision, to be empowered and affirmed to make the best decision for themselves and, and for that child. Whereas an agency, many of them are faith-based. Um, some are not, but they will often describe themselves as a ministry or a service to both birth and adopting parents. I think with agencies, sometimes those those lines that I've just described um, with um, as attorneys, they are are not as clear. Now, they may say, and to, in their own defense, mind you, I'm, I'm not trying to make a qualitative distinction here, which, um, because I think adoption can be very collaborative, and there, there often are not those kind of controversies, and agencies work very well, and I actually represent two of them here in South Carolina that I'm very proud to to work with. But um, I think that 
the uh, the lawyer model probably rests on those those clear lines of representation, whereas the agency model is more of a collaborative approach. And and so when somebody uh, hires an adoption attorney, when an adoptive family hires an adoption adoptive attorney, adopt an adoption attorney, would the would the expectant couple or the expectant mom have a separate representative to to educate her, represent her her interest in this? In most states, um, and I think that the the the, the model that is uh, is is well recognized is that uh, a lawyer cannot serve two masters. Um, there there needs to be um, appropriate representation, meaningful representation throughout the process. Not wind addressing representation. Not someone who comes in and spends 15 minutes with a birth parent before they sign a relinquishment. Um, someone who has really been there and uh, has no dog in the fight other than to represent the interests of that birth parent. In the long run, that actually serves the adoptive parent as well. It's a far better adoption story to describe that, mm-hmm. yes, we honored your birth parent by allowing her and, and or him to take the time that was necessary to have a reflection period before before that, we paid to have that representation. Um, all of canons of professional conduct um, allow an adoptive parent to pay for the sort the resource of the birth parent having a lawyer or counselor, and it's very clear that the duty of that lawyer or that counselor goes to the birth parent, not to who paid them. Um, mm-hmm. That that uh, that that is a, a a fundamental distinction that that birth parents also must know that just because they're not paying that person doesn't mean that person doesn't owe them that that right and that duty. And I think those are the kind of distinctions that an attorney that's well versed in this area knows. And the, kind of the old school would be, you know, a birth parent would come in to sign a consent, and the lawyer would call down the hallway to his friend or colleague or somebody who does real estate closings, and they come in and they witness the consent, and we're in and out in a matter of a few minutes. Um, that's just a per se um, best practice now that it just wouldn't look anything like that. And and it wouldn't honor the child or the birth parent for an adoptive uh, adoption lawyer or an agency to to try to, to do truly, something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah, to not truly represent them. Can adoption attorneys work with families in other states? Let's say somebody in Missouri wants to contact you in South Carolina or or, or contact a different adoption attorney in, in Illinois. Um can uh, can you work across state lines? Yes. It but it, again it just depends on the state. South Carolina allows um an adoption uh, for any child that's present in the state of South Carolina at the time of filing, regardless of residency, that's a wide open definition. Most states aren't aren't like that, but they they have some sort of residency requirements or some nexus um, with the um, for jurisdiction with the child and or birth parents and or the adopting parents. Um, it, there really is a, a a wide variety of those permutations that can happen about where any given adoptive parent might be able to look for an adoption resource. Um, it's state by state. And, and I frankly don't keep these in my head. Um, I And the, the rules are changing. So if someone were to contact me from one state or another, I have my, um, my handy-dandy uh, catalog of the American mm-hmm. Academy of Adoption Attorneys. And thankfully, I know when I call one of those names, they're going to know without having to look it up, without having to put me on hold, they're going to be able to tell me what it's like to do an interstate adoption or even if that's possible uh, right. with that yeah. state or between our states. Bottom line is you need to check with an attorney that knows the adoption law and uh, uh, to, to and ask that question to them. You are and before to, you – I'm sorry, Dawn, forgive no, me. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, and before you do the first thing, because mm-hmm. I've seen situations where people are paying living expenses, you know, out of the goodness of their heart, they are, you know, yep. they're mm-hmm. doing fine, but guess what? That living expense is not legal under that other state law, and it could even yeah. be 
a criminal violation. So that is something that we do see, and uh, we do see periodically on our in our support group, or we'll get email questions on that uh, that exact thing. You need to check with an adoption attorney or an adoption agency that when the adoption agencies would, would usually normally be working with an attorney who can answer that question before you spend any, before you have any, not necessarily contact, but before you spend any money. Um, you are listening to Creating a Family, talk about adoption and infertility. We are so glad to have you with us on this show, talking about using an adoption uh, consultant, a facilitator, or attorney. We primarily keep in touch with our audience through our twice-weekly e-newsletter. We let you know about the latest developments in adoption and infertility, as well as the upcoming week's blog and show topic, as well as some of the other resources that we've added to our site that week. You can sign up for the weekly newsletter on our, let me remind you, brand new Creating a Family website. Must go check it out, everyone. Up in the upper right-hand side, there is a box for signing up for the newsletter. All right. Now, I wanted to uh, talk about the ever-important issue of cost. Uh, And and again, if you can, I'm going to ask each of you this, but if you could, uh, if you know of the range that is typical for your industry, consultancy, facilitators, or or attorneys, that would be helpful. So what is the typical cost uh, for your services, or better yet, as I said, the range of cost for services of others throughout the U.S.? Um, and go, we'll start. Uh, uh, we'll go ahead and follow the same order that we've been in. Nicole, let's start with adoption consultants. How much can people expect to pay if they wanted to hire an adoption consultant? Well, it does vary, and uh, you know, different consultants offer different services. For instance, you know, we offer four different packages depending on the amount of support that somebody's looking for. But the the sort of full support. Um, concept that is what we've discussed on the show today. Um, what we charge, and it's pretty much in line with most of the um, the other experienced, reputable consultants that I'm aware of, uh, is about three thousand dollars. And that's so it's a one-time three thousand dollar fee. Exactly. Okay, gotcha. Okay, and let's move to uh, facilitators. Lisa, to the extent that you can speak to uh, the range that facilitators charge, and again, you may have to qualify that based on what they're doing, but go ahead and give the full service option. Sure. It's 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 a huge range. And it's I think it's around, there's about 25 of us who are registered here in California, and the services range from about 5,000, I think, up to 16,000. And, again, not every facilitator offers the same services, just like consultants, so it's really important to find out what services are being provided. Um, Mm -hmm. I know that top range comes with, you know, some people who have been doing this for 20-plus years or more. Um, There's a couple of larger facilitators here in California who have full staffs and and, um, establish uh, um, walk-ins, so their overhead obviously is a little higher, so they have to take care of those things. Mm-hmm. Can I add also, Don, um, sure. you know, the, I think one of the biggest differences, too, between consultants and facilitators, and I wanted to add this because so often I hear that uh, facilitators aren't accountable, and it's, it's really not true because here in the state of California, it's, it's kind of a stringent process to become a facilitator. You can't just um, become an adoptive parent and say, hey, that was fun, I want to do this for others. It's it's you have to apply to the state. You have to have references from three other professional entities, and those have to be adoption attorneys or licensed agencies here in the state of California. You have to go through a background check, and you have to have an either or three to five years of either job-related experience, or you have to have gone to school and have a degree in social work or or health services, something like that. And then every year the state, you have to reapply for that um, privilege to be a facilitator here in California. So there is an office at the state level that that checks yearly on er what everybody's doing. So I just wanted to to add that. Sure. I think that is important for people to understand that facilitators just don't open up and say, this is what I want to do. And again, you're speaking as to California. Okay. Now, in Ca- Jim, yes, in California. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, you give yes. us a 
typical range of cost, and again, uh, we must let people know that, that it really does depend on the, the services provided, but give it, qualifying it that way, can you give us a range of cost for an adoption through an adoption attorney? They do range, and we got, one must make sure you're comparing apples, um, you know, apples to apples. Um, it, it may be a thousand dollars to finalize an adoption that has already been placed, and the attorney is not involved with any of the ongoing case management of the placement. You know, very, right, that's very a, inexpensive, yeah. uncontested case. If a lawyer is involved just by um, helping an agency, and after the agency's already done all of that work, the bulk of the fee would be the agency, and the, and the lawyer may have a, a two or three thousand dollar a fee, including the cost to finalize. If mm-hmm. the attorney is handling all aspects of the adoption, mm-hmm. um, meaning from placement, of, you know, a turnkey job all the way through to new birth certificate mm-hmm. and, and identifying the prospective adoptive parent, then you would have those cost of fees that would normally be the agency plus the law firm. And so mm-hmm. an average adoption cost um, for a placement like that may be you know, well above uh, $20,000. Um, I think that a lot of uh, adoption costs total um, – in the in the studies that I have seen can range between twenty five and even forty thousand dollars for a infant adoption, mm-hmm. um, whether that be agency based or lawyer based. So we have to talk about all of the, the costs when someone is is scheduling um you know, or, or or making those plans. You know, that's a very good point and, and I uh was gonna point that out. We have a page on our site uh, a section on our site talking about the typical cost for adoptions, uh, and uh, and and it's a, a tur- as you point out, it's a turnkey. Whether you use a um, um, adoption attorney or an adoption agency, it's uh, from beginning to end, um, um, soup to nuts, or whatever the, that expression is. And the average cost with working uh, with an agency is about thirty four thousand. Uh, and the average cost with working with an attorney is about 30000 And that, again, depends on, uh, but as you point out, if you're working with an attorney and you have identified a, uh, an expectant woman who wants to place with you and, it, then, and, and everything has been done before you get to the attorney and the attorney is simply mm-hmm. more or less just finalizing the adoption, then that's, uh, that would be a different cost. Another question right. that we got beforehand um, that we to ask each of you is the how how long it takes to adopt utilizing one of your services, and uh, again, there's going to be variation there. But let's just say the average wait for families uh, that that worked with you in a 2014. If you've got those, if you figured that out, which you probably have. What was the average weight, uh, Nicole, for families that were working with you? Or if you know the right, general number, if you yeah, know generally, say, you speak for consultants in general, that would be great. But if you can't, just give us your specifics. Right, yeah, I definitely can't speak for consultants in general on this point. But for us, um, you know, we to be clear, we sort of start – counting that time frame, if you will, from when people are out there and ready to be presented to birth moms, you know, meaning, meaning that their, um, their profile's done, their home study's done, and they are active with those agencies and attorneys, right? Because everybody takes a different amount of time to get through that part of the process. But once people are out there being presented to birth moms, almost all of our clients adopted in the three to 12 month range, and our average was about six months. Okay, what about uh, for you, uh, Lisa? I, I would like to start first with saying that this is one of my favorite questions because it, on every adoption education site out there, it, when it says if somebody tells you how long the waits are, that's a red flag. So um, we try to avoid telling people how long, but the average is, is the same with Nicole. I mean, it could be two weeks or it could be six months, and it's really going to mm-hmm. depend on um, – what the family's waiting for, what their expectations are in an adoption plan. Because well, I agree with you on the, it, it being a red flag. I do agree with that if somebody's <laughs> promising you, but I also think that right. you can say what your average is for 2014. That's a, that's a, a guaranteed number. That's not a promise for the future. Right. For it, it, and the average is about three to six months. 
Okay. And that was that was your 2014 type. Right. Uh, that was your 2014 average. And Jim, what about? And again, you can't speak for all attorneys. I realize. Um, and but go ahead and just tell us what would be the average weight. And it's fair to start from the process of when the time, counting the time for when people are being ready to be presented to uh, potential uh, uh, expect well, to expected parents. That's right. I think it's it is important though what kind of information people are willing to give. That is the best in, indicator of the kind of agency or attorney that you want to be working with because. If you say, well, how many active families do you have? What were the average number of placements, you know, in that program? And then what was the average wait time for the last three years? That's how we give it at our law firm. Mm-hmm. So, um, and and it is very specific about the degrees of openness someone may have, the race of the child can, can make a special needs Big of difference. a child, the age of a child. All of those things are different. But at our law firm, I would say there was an average of about 10 months wait. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, Dawn, if you mind, if I may. No, um, please. I I think that um, my colleague in this call, um, Lisa, did point out some things about California, and 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 perhaps just as a as an attorney, I I um I also am participating in the call. I feel a need to point out that I guess all the facilitators. Am I right, Lisa? In terms of California, do do you, do we know of any other states that uh, allow this uh, this um, registration other than California for something called facilitators? It's, um, I didn't want to leave an impression with uh, with your listeners that that term facilitator is the same um, all over mm-hmm. the country. I'm glad you brought that no, up. I, I was going to ask that exact question is to you, Jim, in just a minute, but I'm really glad you brought that up. Go ahead, Lisa. I interrupted. Yeah, I think it is exclusive to California, and um, it, and, and that's why I, I appreciate the, the topic of this show today because there are other services in other areas of the of the country who do provide very similar um, adoption related services, but their states don't require the same type of registration program. Here, like I said, here in California, I remember when I first started uh, working in private adoption, I remember setting up a, an educational website, um, and the state called me and told me I either needed to take it down or I needed to register as a facilitator. So there, the, the state of California is very particular and concerned when it comes to working in adoption and claiming yourself whether, you know, you need to be an attorney, you need to be an agency, or you need to be a facilitator. You can't even offer educational services if you're collecting a fee and not call yourself a facilitator here in here in California. Would it be fair to say uh, uh, that if you are, from our audience who's listening, if you are considering using a facilitator, if you are considering using a facilitator, you need to know that there is no uniform definition of that term, and you need to ask questions to figure out who it is you're working with. Because outside of in many states, a facilitator is not a uh, it's not an entity that has any legal standing or any legal requirements or, or licensure. Would that be a fair? Summary, and I'm, I'm asking that both to let me ask you to Jim, and because you, you might be able to speak to other states better than Lisa. Sure, I'd be glad to answer that. Um, I think a good resource, if anyone is interested in looking more deeply into this, is written by um, an attorney friend of mine with the American Academy, Lynn Bodie, B O D I. She has written an article regarding facilitators and their effect on the adoption process, and that was published in the National Council for Adoption, the Adoption Fact Book, number four. Um, and th- so the National Council on Adop- Adoption defines um, facilitator um, in, in that um, document as a person or entity that is not an approved or licensed agency or an attorney that acts on behalf of a, a birth parent or the prospective adoptive parent in connection with the placement. So it can have a really a mixed definition. Um, mm-hmm. I think that, and if I may, Lisa, I'll, I'll exclude my present company because uh, the difference in California, mm-hmm. I think, is a marked difference. But for those people who might be using a facilitator 
I think it's important to know that there are many of them that may have a a sincere desire to help parties involved, um, mm-hmm. but there's also it presents an opportunity for these facilitators to be unscrupulous. Um, there is no regulatory body that scrutinizes the, either the, the reasonableness of the fees or the scope and the quality of the services. Um, facilitators need not hold a specialized license. They need not have any professional certification or educational background to hold themselves out as a facilitator. There's no minimum requirements for credentials or training. And when we talk about counseling birth parents, um, I think it's just vitally important that there be a a higher level of service. In South Carolina, it's illegal to pay um, anyone that's not listed as certain credentials, and that would include consultants or um, facilitators. And so for that reason, um, even a facilitator that's licensed and registered, I've made the personal decision that I won't work with an adoption that involves them. So I I do think that the word facilitator is very positive, has different orientations in different worlds, but but in my world of adoption, um, it means unlicensed, unregulated, unaccountable. All right, and that's a you know that is something, and one of the things that that should be coming loud and clear is that each state in the United States has different laws when it comes and pertains to the world of adoption, and uh, what may be okay in your state or encouraged or totally fine is not necessarily fine in another state, and that leads me to what will be our final question, and that is from Lorraine. She says, the timing of this show is so good. We decided over the holidays to stop treatment and start the adoption process, and I have been so confused about all of this. How do we know if we are allowed in our state to use a facilitator or a consultant? And if we use a facilitator or a consultant and it isn't allowed, what happens? Um, I think, Jim, this is more of a legal question, so let me direct that to you. So what would happen if somebody in a state uses a facilitator or a consultant and it's not allowed, although I don't know of any states that don't allow consultants, but maybe that should be our first question. Jim, or do you know of any states that don't allow an adoption consultant? Well, the, the, the South Carolina statute and many other statutes um, have a listing of what is allowed to be paid. It's more a question of finances. And it's not a question of services. So if, if a consultant wants to do their work for free, I imagine it's allowed anywhere. A, a consultant, though, in South Carolina who's not a licensed child placing agency or a certified adoption investigator is not allowed under South Carolina statute. And and I, I am aware that there are many states that have an ex, an exhaustive list, a, an exclusion an exclusionary list of what can be paid or what is appropriate. Um, I actually view consultants very differently from facilitators because when you when you when you move from working with this prospective adoptive parents to working with birth parents, I think that's a significant difference because it's an adoption service. But then again, I think working with adoptive parents, if it's discussing general risk associated, I think that requires a higher level of um, experience and education and licensure. So in in short, I think that that we really need to be careful um, about payment because money can taint the adoption process and to whom it's paid may be illegal based on state law. So if you were to use uh, a facilitator or consultant, and in your particular state it was prohibited, what would happen? That was, I think, Lorraine's question. Yeah, you know, it's very interesting. South Carolina in 2007 amended our statute to say that if if an expense is not allowed by law, the court has the discretion of not granting the adoption or granting it if it's in the child's best interest, but then policing those persons involved. So it, there's a wide range of of uh, choices. It might mean that the person is ordered to disgorge the ill-gotten gains, um, but it could cause the adoption itself to be set aside based on illegal payment. So the key is to figure out what is acceptable in your state because each state 
uh, has very different laws. You know, when I was involved uh, in, uh, when I talk with people about international adoption and they think, they listen to the the laws of the country and they say, oh my gosh, those laws are so complex, they're so confusing. And I think, well, maybe, but I mean, at least it's one law in our state. I mean, in our country, we may have, we have 50 different laws. I mean, we, we, uh, we live in a glass house when it comes to throwing stones at, at complexity. Let me take this last moment to remind you that our wonderful gold sponsors are who brought you this show, and, and they wouldn't be here, and this information wouldn't be being presented to you without them. A couple of more of our uh, great gold sponsors include Hopscotch Adoptions. They are a national adoption agency with offices in North Carolina and New York, placing children from Bulgaria, Georgia, Ghana, Armenia, Morocco, and Serbia. And we also have the Independent Adoption Centers, whose mission is to provide open adoption placement and counseling to birth and adoptive families. They work with families in all 50 states and are fully licensed in California, New York, Florida, Texas, and more. Thank you so much for listening to our show today. We have a favor to ask. Uh, iTunes, as well as uh, the other uh, uh, organ- uh, not organizations, but the other entities that, that disseminate radio shows online, uh, know who to recommend based on our ratings. Uh, Creating a Family is the top-rated show in this subject matter, and we want to continue to be there and to continue to be recommended. So we would really appreciate it if you would go on to iTunes, which is by far the largest rating entity, and give us a rating. It's a star rating, unless you really feel generous, and then you can leave a comment, and that would be great too. You can, uh, If you have iTunes on your phone, tablet, or computer, you can just uh, go in there, type in Creating a Family, and give us a rating. Or you can go to the radio show page of our website, creatingafamily.org slash radio show, and uh, then uh, click on iTunes, and it will take you to the rating uh, for uh, this show. And we would appreciate that very much. Thank you so much, Lisa Sweet, Jim Thompson, and Nicole Witt, for being our guest today on Creating a Family. If you want to participate in a discussion of the topics of this show, you can check out my blog tomorrow on creatingafamily.org slash blog. To get more information on any of our guests and the services they offer, you can go to their websites, which are, to get information on Jim Thompson, his website is jamesfletcherthompson.com. That's all one word, jamesfletcherthompson.com. To get more information on Nicole Witt, you can go to the Adoption Consultancy website, which is theadoptionconsultancy.com. Again, all one word, theadoptionconsultancy.com. And to get more information on Lisa Sweet or on Sweet Beginnings, you can go to their website, which is adoptions, no, no, wait a second, let me say that again, Adoption Sweet Beginnings. Dot com. Let me say that again since I messed it up. AdoptionSweetBeginnings.com. Thank you so much for joining us today. I will see you next week, and I look forward to it.